especially, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but it actually takes a lot of bravery to exhibit this kind of work, even in a gallery space. Um, and I'm aware of the fact that a uh, gallery is a business, and selling vulvas is maybe not the most <laughs> uh, topic. It doesn't go well over your couch necessarily. Um, and so I, I just really appreciate the opportunity uh, to show this work um, here in this beautiful space. Um, I have had issues in the past with trying to show my work and having censorship. Um, yeah, so even beyond having trouble showing the work in spaces, uh, advertising my work has been problematic. Um, Instagram is the main medium that most visual artists use to share their work with other people. Um, and for the most part, this often gets flagged. Um, and so it's hard for me to show uh, my pieces online uh, on that avenue as well as publications. Um, for example, I, I contacted the American Art Collector to see if I could advertise the show. And they said that's fine as long as it's just the fruit pieces. <laughs> so, and I just thought, it's okay. Um, but I, I wanted to tell you, I guess, a little bit about me and, and my background. Um, so I grew up in a really rural area in a small town in Pennsylvania. Um, I had a pretty conservative upbringing, I would say. Um, my mom's side, that we had Mennonites, and on my dad's side, um, he was, uh, my dad was Iranian, and um, so he was raised Muslim, so um, they had some really traditional um, values that they instilled in me. I went to Catholic school, uh, for elementary school, um, and then I was homeschooled for two years, one of those years at my local church, so um, I have a pretty wholesome upbringing, and so this, um, this topic was a little bit scary for me to broach, needless to say. Um, I started first uh, doing the fruit paintings. Um, and I was actually in college at the time when I started doing these fruit paintings. Um, the school that I went to was in West Virginia. It's also a pretty conservative state. Um, but it was a conceptual school, so it wasn't really focused on technique necessarily and learning art skills. Um, it was more about ideas and concepts, like what are you trying to say? They really pushed um, contemporary art, which they considered to be uh, something novel or thought-provoking. Uh, they wanted it to be um, something that might uh, spark new ideas or conversations. Um, and so what they trained us to do was, I guess, to think and um, hopefully be able to talk about our work um, and the ideas behind it. Um, and so <laughs> when I had the vision of fruit paintings, I, everything works differently, but um, the idea of fruit paintings came to me just as a vision when I woke up literally one day, you know, for sleep, and I, I envisioned something kind of like that orange painting in the back there, which is this big, glowing, juicy image of, of an orange. And, um, and then I had to come up with an explanation for why it was that I was going to be painting still life. Um, still life wasn't really a popular topic at my school um, because it's a very traditional subject matter. Um, and so I just kind of scoured my personal life for why I might be wanting to make uh, paintings about fruit. And what was going on in my personal life at the time was I was married. Uh, I had married my high school sweetheart. And I don't know, it was maybe five years in or something like that. Um, and he had developed a crush on a girl at work. And I was really devastated. Uh, and I really wanted to try to understand um, more about this. I had crushes myself in the past. Um, I was really pro at just idealizing a uh, person that I didn't necessarily know and like holding on to this idea of, um, I don't know, fantasy. Uh, and so I understood that uh, partially, but 
um, it was something I was thinking about a lot while I was making these paintings that I was really trying to capture that idea of um, perfection, of an idealized image, of, um, of longing, of desire, um, lust even. And, um, and I found this guy who calls himself a positive psychology expert and has an explanation <coughs> Um, for this phenomenon. He calls it uh, the rival fallacy, and he wrote a book called Happier. And in this book, he explains that anchoring on future goals triggers reward centers in the brain, inducing cognitively soothing effects. So the feeling of accomplishment becomes part of your day to day identity. And you readily adjust to this new state of being, so much so that actually attaining the goal turns out to be less satisfying than expected. And I think that this is a phenomenon that many of us can relate to, maybe have experience. Um, you know, maybe after you have put on an art show that you spent a long time working towards, <laughs> or you run a marathon, or you get that promotion, um, and you just feel deflated afterwards. But the thing is that while you have uh, this goal or this object that you're chasing, it's actually. Um, triggering that reward center in your brain and uh, <coughs> lots of issues after that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I exhibited my first fruit uh, series um, in college as a senior. It really encouraged you to work in a series. Um, and the idea behind that is that um, maybe you could create a brand for yourself, something recognizable that if somebody saw your work, they could say, oh, this is Hannah. You know, I, I, I've seen your work before. Um, and so was, I was putting on that show, and it was right around that time that I got, I woke up with another vision, and this one was of a giant bulk. Um, no explanation. I would have liked to really come with an explanation, but I was really just enough to guess. Like, what does this mean and um, where is this coming from? And so um, my first guess was that I was reacting towards feelings of shame. And so I was kind of looking at my environment and you know examining myself to see um, where the shame might have come from. And the first thing that I noticed was that um, uh, outside of us, uh, in public spaces, we have monuments. We have a lot of phallic monuments. For example, the um, the Washington, what's it called? It's in Washington D.C. You know, Washington like the big, Washington yes, Washington. the Washington Monument. Exactly. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, I couldn't even come up with a word for the female equivalent of phallic. I don't, I don't know if there is one. Um, but it got me thinking about how we use um, she runs like a girl or she fights like a girl um, or even the term pussy as an insult and like female is synonymous with um, being lesser and so that was my first thought, my first observation. Um, and another hypothesis I had was that this came from a more personal shame. And I want to apologize in advance if I make anyone comfortable um, sharing something so personal. Um, author Renee, her, Renee Brown is one of my favorite authors, and she writes a lot about vulnerability and shame. And she says that shame means three things to grow exponentially secrecy, silence, and judgment. So I want to talk about my secret shame, and I hope that you won't judge me. <laughs> the ugly truth that I was hiding from the world for most of my life was that I was molested as a child. Um, this happened at the hands of two separate uncles, and it started from the age of four. Um, in both situations, I was the common denominator, so I thought it was my fault. Um, obviously, carrying this belief made me feel cheap. Uh, she for my body and she for my sexuality. <clears throat> so I thought maybe my subconscious um, 
was trying to tell me something, and that maybe my subconscious was trying to say, this is something um, that you have an opportunity to heal, and you know, painting these uh, bolas is a way to um, overcome the shame. Um, but I felt like if I was going to make this work, other people were going to see it. And I wanted for other people to be able to relate to it. And I really felt like this is something that was personal, like it maybe uh, didn't apply to other people. You know, it was something that happened um, in isolation and I didn't feel comfortable talking about to other people. And I think that's really common um, for victims of sexual abuse. Um, you know, it's not something that's easy to talk about. And so a lot of people think that it's just them. Um, but when I dug further doing my research, I found out that I wasn't alone. Um, the Department of Justice says that one in four women and one in six men are sexually abused during their lifetime. Um, that's higher for transgender people and that's higher for gay people. The majority of these assaults happen before the age of 18. Um, and they're often committed by those that are closest to us, their friends and relatives and trusted people in the community, and they usually happen close to home. The effects are insidious, and if something like this happens to you, even if you try to block it out and move past it, it's still something that you carry around in your body as trauma. Um, and this kind of trauma, especially when it happens at an early age, can be really disruptive to your nervous system um, and to your brain while it's forming. When something like this happens to you, you feel ugly and you feel unsafe. The Bureau of Justice Statistics estimates that only 28% of victims actually report their assault to police. Um, so as far as I can tell, the only way to minimize the detrimental effect of that sort of thing is to come to an acknowledgement that what happened was not your fault. Um, if you're a child, you were not asking for it. Um, if your skirt was too short, or you had a drink, or you smiled too much, it was not your fault. Um, this is why I think that the Me Too movement was so impactful, um, because it helped victims realize that they're not alone, and gave a lot of people the courage to speak up, and even to pursue justice. Um, shame about our bodies, about pleasure, about our sexuality um, is not um, unique to people who have experienced sexual violence. I think um, that affects the average person walking around as well. Um, I have kind of an inflammatory statement that is, it's meant to be a loaded question. Um, this is true or false. Virgins hold more value than sluts. I think that the feelings that the statement provokes says a lot about our social programming. Um, so back uh, when I was exhibiting my fruit paintings, I had the idea of creating the vulva paintings in my mind and in my heart, I wanted to paint them. Um, and I wasn't sure how people would react. And so I was listening really closely to comments at my show um, to see how people would react to the, um, the sexual undertones that were in my work because it definitely um, has elements of human sexuality of lust and desire. And what I found was that people who came seemed like they were really um, reticent about addressing that, like they were um, maybe embarrassed about acknowledging the, um, the element in my artwork, and that made me really curious. And I was curious um, because that doesn't necessarily affect all aspects of our life. Um, so I was in West Virginia, like you said, it was a pretty conservative area. But at the same time, in that little town, we had five strip clubs. 
Um, and <laughs> five. Uh, does the envy college age? You know, I had a lot of my friends and you know people, classmates um, who had stories about frequenting them, and you know, I definitely heard guys talking about themselves about uh, watching porn or um, and. I didn't, I, I guess, I wanted to know what the difference was um, in, in response uh, to my work in a gallery type setting. And my conclusion was that the difference is context. Um, that if we're following social norms, people are generally more comfortable. Um, and it is within the bounds of social norms um, if women's bodies are used as marketing tools um, for entertainment, to sell products, um, and to be commodified as products themselves. Um, but I really wanted to create a visual alternative that I haven't seen out there um, or that didn't really exist at the time. Um, and so I wanted to create works of art that were portraits um, with the idea in mind to share them in a gallery space. Um, I wanted to give them a place of respect and honor to celebrate how beautiful I really think they are. Um, and yeah, give them the respect that they deserve. Um, and so I went ahead and, and I made these paintings, not really knowing where I was going to show them or, or who was going to see them or what they would think. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk, I guess, a little bit about porn. I know that it's here to stay. I know that it's um, more, more ubiquitous. Um, but I think that it's problematic in the way that um, it informs people about women's bodies specifically. I think that it gives people an unrealistic expectation of what our bodies should look like, uh, not to mention what sex should be like. Um, so around the time of my divorce, I remember talking to a guy friend. Uh, at the time, I was really sheltered, actually. So I married my high school sweetheart, literally the first guy I kissed. Um, and so when I got divorced, like my world kind of opened up. I started talking to other people and learning more things about like how other people thought. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I was talking to this guy friend, and he was talking to me about um, attractive, uh, attractive vaginas. I don't know what words to use. Um, but I it was really like, what makes a vagina attractive? Like, <laughs> but I just thought, I don't, I don't know. And he was really incredulous, and he was like, haven't you ever seen porn? Like, the small ones are pretty. And it really, Send me. I was like, so now there's something else that women have to worry about. <laughs> so um, I was like, do women compare themselves to porn stars now? Like, is that's that's what we're doing? But uh, in talking to other people um, and looking online, um, that is actually a thing, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted to read you another quote. Um, this is from a, a site called thisisthevalwa.com. Um, and this is someone who just puts a lot of information out there for women um, to help other women feel less insecure about what they have um, and just to be informative. So she says, labioplasty is the fastest growing plastic surgery with 45% increase between 2015 and 2016. And the people that want it can be as young as nine years old. Labioplasty is a surgery that alters your vulva and or your vagina. Its main focus is to make the inner labia smaller. You can also cut a triangle from your vaginal opening sew it together, and make the vagina smaller. You can also inject fillers into your outer labia and make them puffier. None of these things are necessary. They do not enhance you in any way. They do not make you more attractive or have better sex. In fact, labioplasty runs the risk of severing nerves in your clitoris 
and numbing sexual feeling in your vulva for good, which is not good. <laughs> a tiny number of people may want labiaplasty if their labia are painful when exercising, during sex, or wearing tight clothing. But let me repeat myself, the number of women who choose this option is tiny. The majority of labiaplasty is undertaken by people who feel like their body doesn't look right. Where have we got this idea? She's writing from the UK. Where have we got this idea that our natural bodies are so awful that we can only be happy if we chop bits off? Who got to decide what the perfect vulva should look like? Why do we want to spend thousands of pounds on surgery that might end up with us losing feeling in the most sensitive place on our body? According to the Gynodiversity Report, 48% of labia are not symmetrical, meaning they look different on each side. 73% of vulvas have inner labia that are visible and protrude farther than the outer labia. So whether you sit in the 73% or the 27% that don't protrude, your vulva is normal, and it's exactly as it needs to be. So since I began painting vulvas in 2007, I feel like there's been an explosion in uh, artwork around this topic. Um, and a lot of information has come to light. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the influences um, that inform my work. I feel like um, the artists that come before us uh, impact us whether we realize it or not. Um, but there are three main women that I want to talk about. The first is Sophia Wallace, um, and she's young, she's just 44, um, and I really admire her. She does artwork, she's an art activist, um, and she does promote something called glitteracy. So she coined that term and she wants to inform people about the anatomy of the clitoris. Um, before encountering her work, I didn't actually know the anatomy of the clitoris. I, I think most of us learn that it's um, small, uh, and it's just, um, you know, under the clitoral hood, and it's, it's like little. Um, but actually, she, uh, some of her work, so she does um, text-based work, some of it is just words, um, you know, there might be words that cover a whole wall, or there might be just like a small um, piece of words. Uh, but she also does sculptures that show the actual structure of the clitoris. Um, and one of her uh, text-based art says the clitoris is not a button, it's the tip of an iceberg. And the sculptures show that it's actually kind of the shape of a wishbone almost. Um, and so what you see sticking out is actually, like she said, just a tip. Um, but it actually goes on the inside and there's two giant legs um, that are on either side of the vaginal canal. And just like with the men, it's made out of erectile tissue and it swells. Um, and so I, I don't know why I didn't learn that in sex ed class um, <laughs> in magazines, but um, I, I totally recommend looking up her work um, if that's at all interesting to you. Uh, another um, icon is Judy Chicago, um, and she has her work actually in the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Um, and her, she did this installation uh, called The Dinner Party, which many of you may have heard of. And basically, um, it takes up an entire room. It's a, it's a big triangle of a table. Um, and there's place settings. And the place settings, each place setting honors a different woman throughout history. And some of them are um, actual women. Some of them are um, mythological women. And, like Joan of Arc, um, who uh, other people can um, look up to, you know, for inspiration. But in these play settings, she um, has plates, and on the plates are um, vulvas, um, 
they're, they're not representational like these are. They're a little bit more Georgia O'Keeffe abstract. Um, but her work definitely, um, I, I feel like, paved the way for my work in some ways. So I wanted to, to mention her. And another is Eve Ensler, um, who is a playwright. And she wrote the, the Vagina Monologues. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a, a series of monologues where she went around and interviewed other artists, um, I'm sorry, other uh, women um, on their experiences about their vaginas, basically just um, talking about yeah, their, um, their stories. And um, I, I think that my main takeaway from the monologues was that it helped people be comfortable saying the word vagina out loud. Um, and so her play came out in, I think, 1996, so it's been out for a while. Um, every year the production goes on around Valentine's Day um, all across the country and, and all across the world. And I, I really do think that she's helped change the way that we think about uh, vaginas. Um, as something not to be ashamed of, not ashamed to have one, not ashamed to, to talk about them. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the work that she did. Um, and, and the last person I wanted to mention um, is Catherine Blackledge, who wrote this really fascinating book. Um, what's interesting to me about it, so the book is called Raising the Skirt, The Unpow Unsung Power of the Vagina. And she talks about stories of women who literally raised their skirts um, throughout history. And um, this is something I've never heard of before, but actually there are lots of stories um, dating back to ancient Egypt and Greece. Um, there are stories of women in Persia and Indonesia and Ireland. Um, and these are stories of women who are lifting their skirts and bearing their balas as a powerful force to be reckoned with. So the way that this has been used is um, different in different contexts, but um, some of the ways are women would lift their skirts to the seas to protect the fishermen, <coughs> or they would raise their skirts um, to the fields to um, chase away evil spirits, but also to um, promote um, abundance and, um, and towards the livestock to promote fertility. Um, and there's stories of women who have lifted their skirts to change the outcomes of battle and women who have lifted their skirts in protest. Um, and I, I find that <coughs> really inspiring that um, <coughs> we have these stories from our ancestors of women that have um, seen their vulvas as a, a symbol of, of power and, and um, something to be proud of rather than ashamed of. Um, and so I really um, took inspiration from that. And I, I'm wondering if when that original image <coughs> of um, the giant vulva came to me, if, if it wasn't um, my subconscious actually trying to invoke some of that, um, that goddess energy um, is actually very powerful.